Hey, Matthew. <clears throat> Cameron? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how are you going? Great. Great. Really well. Been a while? Yeah, it has, mate. Well I overdue to a touch up. Yeah, absolutely. Did you get down to B sides? I did not, unfortunately. I had to stay in Sydney, but uh, how about yourself? No, mate. No, same here. Um, it's a bit crazy with me now with two children. So. Oh, wow. Great. So <laughs> when, when was the second one born? Uh, nine weeks ago, mate. <laughs> oh, wow. Fantastic. That's great. So what, what's their name? Yeah, uh, River. River. Oh, sweet. Yeah. yeah. Something nice. different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good. So, uh, and the other one's Max, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Max. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, cool. So it's, he, he, they'd only be like under two. Max is 18 months. 18 so months. Two under two, mate. Yeah. Two under two, <laughs> keep them together. I had, I had three under four at one stage, so it's the way to do it. Knock yeah. them all out, keep them all together. They, they become great mates. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. No, good stuff. How are things going with Stone Type? Oh, good, good. Yeah, we've been um, smashing it, actually. So a yeah. bunch, bunch of really good deals and um, doing a bunch of stuff with, with, uh, with... Actually, we've actually had a whole bunch of new products recently. So we bought a company called MuseDev. All right. Which is basically a sort of a uh, static analysis product, a bit similar to Sony Cube, I guess. Yeah. And just to expand our coverage of that space, because a lot of people want that as well. Yeah, sort of single throat to choke. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And then we okay. also have got a strategic partnership with uh, Neu Vector, sort of adding the the containers, the container piece as well. Okay. What are yeah. you guys doing with containers with New Vector? Yeah, so basically just working with them because they've got this really clever behavioral analysis stuff to do dynamic sort of port blocking and process blocking and, and sort of teach it, you know, programmatically what processes yep. are good and bad. And that's sort of pretty innovative. No one else has got that. So okay. yeah, that that's sort of the differentiator. So you don't okay. have to sit you don't have to sit there and whitelist all the processes. It'll actually do it automatically based on, you know, putting it into a learning mode. Yeah. No, for sure. All right. That makes sense. Yeah, hey everybody right. else. Cool. All right. Going. Gonna, yeah, hey Matt. Cool. Hey boy. Hey Andreas. Hey, Ron. Hey, Brad. Hey, how are you? Hey, Adam. Oh, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Are you catching up with me hey, folks. this afternoon, mate? Me? Brad, yeah? Yeah, uh, Yeah, we can do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I forgot about it if we were, but yeah, no, definitely. It's yeah. at six o'clock. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember, mate. Yep, yep, that's fine. All right, nice. Nice, nice. Um, might add in my marketing person as well to be a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. um yeah oh cool man sweet all right How, how's everyone doing terrific just nervous as in <laughs> before every presentation matt you know oh, <laughs> all right well look it's 12 o'clock we might as well get the ball rolling um so thanks everyone who's here um hey justin Might hand over to our, our fearless leader Justin. He he can handle it. Hello. All right. Well, he's he's muted, but I'll just finish what I was going to say. Um, thanks everyone who's here so far. Um, nice to see you all again. Those who I already know. Um, I've organised with with Andreas here from Red Hat to give a bit of a presentation on software supply chain security by the usage of software factories. If you're familiar with, um, if you're familiar with the DOD DevSecOps uh, framework um, as part of platform one, they, they introduced this concept of software factories and it's, it's pretty cool. So um, he, he will handle that. Um, I, I thought I'd, I'd copy a note from the, the previous agenda on April 21, just to remind everybody that, well, KubeCon's coming up and as part of that, there's Cloud Native Security Day on May the 4th. Um, so if you haven't already, check that out. I think you, you're you going to go to it, aren't you, Brad? What's that, sorry? sorry you're going to go to KubeCon? 
Was that? Uh, de yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. normally go each year. My, my, um, it's not good timing, but um, I just force myself to stay out. No, it's not. Is anybody else going to that? Just out of curiosity, I'm, I'm going to be there in spirit, digitally. We should do a little um, Zoom meeting to hang out in between, or you know, just have a oh, discussion. That's cool. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could have coffee for the first couple of hours and then beer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I normally have an Irish coffee, so I put um, whiskey yeah. in my coffee or bang nice. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very cool. Um, all right. Well, look. Um, that, that's kind of all I, I wanted to say. Um, J Justin, I, I noticed you're you're here. Do you want to do you want to take over? Um, I think that might be pratic. Um, my system is saying it's going to do a software update in a moment. And I have a feeling that that means that I'm going to be disconnected. So, um, uh, you've been doing a great job. Uh, let's, let's have you just continue. Cool, man. All right. Well, look on that note. Um, I hope your system boots goes okay. Do, do you want to just get started Andreas, with this presentation? I think that's why everyone's here and we're all pretty excited to, to see this. Sure, Mark. Do you want to share your screen, and um, and I'll also say hi to. Um, we've got uh, other red hatters on the on the call today as well. Andy Block from um, from the US. He's one of our principal architects there, and um, our distinguished architects. And we've got Adam Goose and Shane Bolden on there, and, and Mark Hildenbrand. And we all work for Red Hat, but uh, we all sort of also you know, interested in this topic. And, and I'm probably the one who's done the, the least amount of work in there. So kudos doesn't belong to me. It's uh, more the people I just mentioned, right? Especially Mark, who was building this, um, this demo in the last few weeks. And um, so, yeah, let's kick off. So um, where, where did the idea come from? So like many, many, a, a few months ago now, right? Um, many weeks, I, I basically watched a recording from one of the CNCF six security uh, sessions in, in the US and then John Meadows was heading this up and, and Andy Martin was sort of presenting the the concept of a, of a software factory and I posted some screenshots in there right so multiple CICD pipelines can be composed into a complex build system and this is called a software factory and it's basically you know used to securely build and deploy all components of a system and at the same time we were then writing that that white paper about supply chain security and we learned about the solar winds attack right and then we looked at this this architecture diagram on the on the right hand side and and mark and i basically looked at that and and go like hmm, yeah what, what are the components and how could we make this better and then we reached out in in good old um, open source fashion to the the wider red hat community across the globe and we actually found that that our uh, teams that work with federal governments across the globe uh, specifically have already started an open source project called Ploigos, and we've got the we've got the links in here. But that that is actually the you know open source way of um, or approach to basically build such a software factory. The only thing we didn't quite well, I didn't quite like about um, the software factory secure bootstrap is that it sort of the idea was to have a a laptop locked away in a, in a vault where you basically could start off that. And, and I thought in a modern enterprise that probably doesn't work that well. So we need to come up with, with other things. And even though boot attestation is not part of this demo today, you know, I think it has a lot of vital building blocks to actually, you know, bring those secure software supply chains into, into enterprises. And then, you know, as you can see, what's the problem? Um, that's not from us, that's from the previous session, like large problem space requiring an end-to-end -end solution. And that's really what this Ploigos is, um, is all trying to do. And on the other, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the, the sort of famous in, in the six security space, right? The DOD enterprise DevSecOps uh, reference design. And so I think all, all the teams, that was sort of a common denominator. We all knew about it and, and uh, we all sort of, you know, agreed with that approach. And, and that's also, why would you see today is aligned with that uh, reference design. So Mark, do you want to get to the next page? So in good, again, in good open source fashion, the UI is probably the last thing that gets updated. So what you see is a, is a flurry of text messages. I'm just going to run you through a couple of screens so that you get used to that when you see it in the demo, what, what it is. So this is really just the text output and there is usually pass uh, messages in there, but the, the, the orange uh, highlighted text is basically failed. So that's why you know 
something is, is wrong. It was interesting. Mark told me the story because we, we were like, Mark was rebuilding that many times over. Right. And, and it fails often because, you know, some, some parts of the, of the project, the open source project have been updated and then you need to sort of recheck all, all the parts. And then when it went this time, you know, Mark was thinking, ah, oh, no, what, what changed now? And then he realized that actually nothing changed, but the software supply chain did actually its job because what it realized is the, as you can see, the title for this step is ensure software patches installed. And there was a new vulnerability. And by checking the content, it actually checked and, and realized that the patches have not been all updated and that's why it failed. And that was a great case um, to, to show us that this is really a good approach and it's working. All right, so next uh, slide then. This is, a, this is a, an OpenShift screen. This is the deployment uh, topology, like all those components are being installed by an operator. And that operator basically takes care of all the components you need to run and set up your, your software supply uh, chain or your software factory as such, right? And we go through the, through the uh, components um, more in detail during the demo, but as you can see there's DT on there, there's um, you know, all those uh, components in there that, that actually makes that a, a comprehensive uh, solution, right? And if you think of enterprise context, that, that's actually what you want. You want a single operator, a certified operator installed, and then you know that everything is taken care of and you can trust that and, and sort of you know, uh, build your enterprise software based on that. So next screen. Pipeline view, this is, um, this is just our, our Jenkins pipeline and um, the blue ocean view. And what, what it shows you is exactly the error message I said earlier in the middle, you see the CI uh, static image scan is failing. And that's just uh, you know show you how it, how it looks like later when you encounter that screen. So the next screen and the context. So the, the Ploigos project is, is not a product, right? What we, what we uh, do, we want to invite everyone who hears about this to contribute and make it a, a successful open source project. It's, um, it's, it's a Red Hat uh, led project at the moment because our consultants all sort of across the globe wanna, wanted to collaborate and you know, that's how it got created. So it's the, the perfect storm basically for, a, for an open source project, um, driving faster results for our customers without reinventing the wheel. And um, yeah, Red Hat Consulting, I mentioned that the DoD website uh, to align with the white paper and, and reference architecture, I mentioned that. And then um, yeah, the SIG security meeting that I mentioned earlier was basically the starting point to, for me to, to think about it and, and, and gather around. And then at the moment, it's teams in Australia and in US um, that talk and um, communicate and collaborate across that. And I mentioned the laptop in the fault that we didn't, didn't like and um, we also have everything you see today is um, is in the script, and that's uh, on uh, on Mark's sort of GitHub account. And the main component, I mean, there are more components on there as you just see. The, so right, the operator, the the um, um, you know Ploigos uh, project, and there is the the Git um, source uh, code management system in there as well. But just as a, on a high level, right, the OpenShift platform is the user interface that you see on the right hand side so it shows you all the the operators that we have here installed and then uh yeah ploigo software factory operator is obviously the, the the main one in this case and then we're using or mark has used record for artifact at the station and i think uh that's it uh, next slide is that where we move over into the demo mark yeah so, so we move over to me mark. yes Thanks, Andreas. So yes, I'm I'm Mark, standing on the shoulders of giants. So I didn't deploy, I didn't create most of Ploigos, but I have used it. Uh, you know, I'm a longtime listener. Not often that I call in, but today I'm going to show you a demo of how Ploigos works. I do have, I do have a live cluster which all, with all this stuff going, but just because builds take a long time and demo gods are benchful, I do have it pre-recorded so we can get through all this in a reasonable amount of time people can still have lunch. So the demo, there's a lot, there's like a couple different demos, seven different little snippets I'll show you, uh, but broadly categorized into three chapters, if you will. So the first one is sort of riffing on what Andreas was just talking about, like, okay, so we have the Department of Defense, they're talking about things like software factories, employee goes, how does it make a software factory? So we sort of hinted at that again with this kind of this is the developer perspective of OpenShift showing you a myriad of boxes, which is probably slightly confusing. We'll try and make more sense of that in a second. 
But what you'll see in this demo that I'm about to show you is that you start with the Flygos operator. And we'll talk about how does that even get in your system that can also be available for air gap systems with which Adam Gussens was on this call, who he's done some contributions to Flygos for even being able to support agencies, government agencies that can even be connected to the internet. So a little bit closer to a laptop in a vault, which uh, Andreas and I like to joke about. But anyway, so the Plogos operator is in some ways a, a root of trust, if you will. The idea is that when you create, you'll see me in the demo create a platform custom resource in true Kubernetes fashion, and the operator will read that. And from that, it figures out what factory, if you will, to create. So we're not building anything yet. We're just building the things that are going to be building things or verifying the things we're building. That's where the operator will busily work. And you'll see in time-lapse time fashion, it kind of build all this stuff out. Just because I created one little custom resource, this is all the magic of Kubernetes. It builds these all out. And the OpenShift developer perspective gives me a view that demos really well. So I'll show you what that looks like. Again, if there are questions, I have a live cluster and all that, so we can get into that, but this is a little helpful. So we'll stop at, start with the operator hub. The important thing here is you see this notion of the provider type. So that provider type says, an operator hub is basically saying, hey, I'd like my cluster to connect to, you know, all these other operators that are available in a marketplace. And some of them are community operators. Some of them are certified by Red Hat because this is Red Hat OpenShift, what you're looking at right now. In our case, the Plugos operator came from a separate kind of provider, which I've installed on the cluster previously. So as an admin, I've decided, yes, I want what they're selling. I want those operators, right? This is what our community, as Andreas said, our consulting group, put these operators together. And this is the Ploigos software factory operator, which I had pre-installed as I, as I promised you on this cluster. If we look at the operator in a little more depth, it looks like any operator, you see the install of the operator succeeded and it looks for two custom resources, a pipeline, which we'll get to and a platform, which we're gonna look at now. There's a form view for the platform sort of, I'm gonna use the YAML view. We'll come back to this at the end. So this is basically prescribing to Ploigos what we want it to build, right? That's the operator that's in the developer perspective. That operator then just starts building things through its blueprint. It knows what it needs to pull in. Now it's pulling in things that go a little bit beyond just the pipeline. Get T, you see pop in there. It's a little bit chaotic. Selenium's coming in there. It's like a thousand little cobbler's elves running off and creating a software factory for me. So this takes uh, I think it took about seven-ish minutes uh, when, when all was said and done. If we take a look at it, this is a platform that is revolving around Jenkins. There is also a Tecton version because who wouldn't want a Tecton version? I'm showing the Jenkins version. That's what I started on. And you can see, like I said, there are elements in here that aren't related just to building. There's also a IDE called Code Ready Workspaces based on Eclipse J. If we look at the platform in a little more detail, so now I'll just compare and contrast the custom resource with what was created. So Gitty, you can see Gitty is over there, right? So basically the things that I called out that I wanted for my continuous integration, the things that I wanted for UIT, Jenkins is there, that'll be important. Static analysis, SonarCube is in there. Good, good, for, good on us for including SonarCube. Nexus is in there. So there's a number of things it's basically, if you will, an implementation or, um, you know, the, the Department of Defense white paper is prescriptive in terms of what you should do, but not what tools you should use. And these, this is sort of our consulting team saying, hey, within Red Hat, these are the tools that we find are the best practice for implementing some of those different stages that every software supply chain should have per the white paper and per our collective wisdom as, as a community. So that's, that's the platform. Any questions about that so far? I realize we're, Andreas and I are kind of dominating. Any, anything anyone wants to add or any questions? Anything that's like totally doesn't make sense? I had a like, question. Can you, can yeah. you just go back to the, um, the YAML file, to just the sure. previous slide. So mm -hmm. we're saying here that you can choose these options and if you want to manage, you know, you can get Argo CD. Is that essentially <clears throat> runs a Helm chart in the background or something and does all your persistent volumes and everything or? That's that's right, though there is a there is some proviso in there. Like as you'll see when we get to the end of the demo, as long as certain things you've implemented certain things ahead of time. But yes, it's been set up so that you can plug and play 
which you see is best. So it stands okay. to reason, if not Argo, you could put in what's called a step runner. You could put in something that allows you to use Flux or something like this uh, if you wanted. In our case, our platform, again, just to give you in the live cluster what this looks like, maybe a little bit easier to see. This is the, yeah, these are the different options that this platform, this is what we tend to use in Red Hat land. Gitty for an internal Git repo, Jenkins, Selenium. Yeah. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it looks awesome. Cool. Cool. Other I questions? Know, so I if it's cool. Um, yeah, just is this specific to OpenShift? Uh, uh it's not well, this is the thing. So it's not meant necessarily to be specific to OpenShift, but for our Red Hat consulting, they tend to use OpenShift because they're Red Hat consultants. But well, yeah. most of the primitives we're using are generic Kubernetes. If somebody else on the call wants to jump in on that. Yeah, I can, you know, I, can, I can add something, Mark. Um, so yeah, so a lot of the primitives, as you mentioned, are using the, what's out of the box with Kubernetes. The operator pattern is one that isn't designed for OpenShift. It's one that can be deployed on any Kubernetes environment because it's just running a control loop. It's just okay. some resource definitions that are applicable to any environment. It just comes down to what you want to enable and how. And um, does it um, account for, let's say, you don't have enough CPU or RAM in the cluster to to install them? Does it just blow up, or it sort of nicely tells you you've exceeded it, your limits? So right now it is kind of um, prescriptive. So we have a bit of a prescriptive stack, but down the road we're going to be looking to seeing different ways to provide more capabilities. As we mentioned on the CI, on the CI perspective, we have Jenkins or Tecton. Uh, they will be exposing more options down the road, because we, especially because I'm field facing, so I see a lot of customers and some want to use one product, some want to use a different product. So we're going to provide better options down the road and provide ways to enable and disable certain features as necessary. Yeah, cool. And as someone who's experienced a fair amount of failure at the hands of this platform, one way you find out is in typical Kubernetes ways. Like you see here, the operator has installed successfully. You could imagine a world where if I didn't have enough compute to create everything that the Ploigos operator needed, like say Code Ready Workspaces or Eclipse J, this would be, it would be in a reconcile loop. And I'd be able to look in the logs. What's that? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay, cool. <laughs> but it's, just, it's uh, not just like what, what's Red Hat providing, right? This is an invitation. If, if you guys see something that, that you want to have as part of the uh, trusted software supply chain or the software factory, then, uh, you know, the invitation is that you implement that. So I, I just, I was making a joke. I just said crash loop back off. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, um, yeah, not being able to pull certain images. Yes, I've, I've, I've seen it all in trying to make this demo. Uh, but yeah, as you will see, like in the, if we look at the topology view, it's it's a number of open source projects. It's not meant to be just Red Hat. Some of them will be things that Red Hat supports again because it's the outworking of our consulting arm at the moment. But as Andrea says, it's we're presenting here because we want it to be more community. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is this is based on the US DoD DevSecOps framework, which is obviously open source, and they they have all of these design paradigms in there anyway. So Really, anybody could take this and apply it to their own system with enough working. Yes, 100%. Excellent. Anything else before we move on to talk a little bit about the pipeline? Ah, oh, thanks, man. That was um, awesome. Not for me. Anyway. Uh, I'm curious a little bit about um, uh, from a security standpoint. So um, I, I think I get what you're doing, but um, do you... Like, is, is there security in this? Is there cryptographic signing of things? Are you using something like Intoto underneath or how, like, what happens if an attacker breaks in and, you know, to like this framework here, can they just go and produce whatever they want as part of it? So I can take a whack at that, though. I know we have some of the people closer to Ploigos. Just first, does anyone closer to Ploigos want to take a whack at it? Otherwise, I'm happy to answer that. I'll just leave some space. So I'll, I'll throw in my two cents in that one. So what I'd say Fine. is that Ploigos on its own is not a substitute for any other security controls that you need at each step. Um, and the, the work that Mark is going to show in terms of the integration with Record is 
I think, you know, is, is good stuff in regards to verifying and attesting the output of each stage of the process and the process overall, but you still want to have um, suitable controls wrapped around it, which is why it also deploys things like single sign-on for, you know, two-factor authentication and things like that as well. Okay, yeah, that helps. And I know um, in Intoto, they're adding like Wrecker into the uh, latest like IT things like this. So I'm, I'm just kind of, it was just kind of curious because it seems like it would be almost no work for you all to integrate and would give you like a huge um, security differential. Um, I mean, it, because like this wouldn't protect against solar winds uh, because solar winds was, you know, bad guys getting into the infrastructure and doing things. But with in total plus this, then you have at least some hope of that happening. And, and for, you know, not a lot of development effort at all. It should be, in fact, it, it should be nearly trivial. You could basically be there. So um, it was just, yeah, was just curious about that. I think Keyline would also, um, you know, play a role into this where you basically start off with boot attestation and, and make sure that the, the right amount of, um, you know, operating system libraries um, boot from, uh, from trusted sources as well. And that's, I think, where you, where you would start off uh, a, 100% secure supply chain. That's right. And and yeah, I know in total, it's not the first time I've heard about it and being close to this project. There's certainly a lot of talk about integrating with it with the North American team. This is just where it stands right now. And, and key lime and boot asset attestation and all that. Yeah, that's, yeah, can be built on top of this. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And for those who don't know, I'll just say the, you know, Intoto is basically a way, it's basically designed to take like kind of cryptographic information about different steps and then let you apply a policy that gets checked over this. And so it's, you know, I, I think if you put a lot of buzzwords on, uh, it, try to distill what's done here into buzzwords and Intoto into buzzwords, there's a lot of overlap. But if you actually look at what's happening, there's a lot of difference. So Intoto is completely agnostic to everything happening in the system. It doesn't care if, you know, it, it has nothing like the functionality here. And so I think um, there's there's a tremendous potential because this is a really slick, um, really like well done, really usable high like high level system that integrates everything together in a good way. And I think you can just sort of get those security properties from Intoto with almost no work. And really have uh, like the best of all worlds for people using this. So, um, yeah. But th this this is really cool. Sorry. Uh, please go ahead and continue. <laughs> no problem. You'll see more overlap as we go, right? The, there's other places where Intoto might overlap, but uh, but yeah. So that's the platform. As Adam said too, not a substitute for typical security controls, principle of least privilege. Having you know, this is all set up to use SAML and all that other kind of good stuff, um, but. But yeah, so it's, as you say, it's an implementation of uh, something that anyone could implement, which is sort of the Department of Defense's kind of best practices, but there are still things that are left out, right? We could still implement, as you say, things like in Toto. Um, and that's just the platform, right? So that's just creating our factory. We haven't yet built anything yet. When we talk about things like solar wind, yes, maybe we could have had a compromised factory that's uh, pumping out something that is itself compromised, but what we're going to talk about next is sort of how you might have other controls where you could start to see if something's been kind of tampered with. So the pipeline and the platform, just as we saw uh, with the operator, right? When we were looking at the operator over here, I look at the installed operators. I go down to my Plurgus operator. It pipelines and platforms. It wants to think about the platform, if you will, as the factory, and then a pipeline as sort of like one of the assembly lines in that factory. Uh, so what does that look like for us? So we already have the platform, custom resource, the operator is still running in the background. What I'm not showing a ton of, and there are other demos out there that talk about like, well, how do I make a project that can that is compatible with Ploigos? The barrier to entry is really low nowadays, though it is still somewhat demonstration when it comes to just any random project out there. There are kind of two things that you need. One is your project should be GitOps ready. So uh, this pipeline kind of assumes that you're gonna have a code repo and some sort of GitOps repo or Helm repo in this case, right? So that's one thing, you'll see that in the custom resource when we build it. 
The second thing is that it assumes that you know enough about your use of Ploigos that you can kind of see it here. You'll see it a little closer in the demo that you have a Jenkins file that tells Ploigos what version of the, the overall kind of groovy script, you'll see that in a second, that you want to use for Ploigos, sort of the thing that binds Jenkins to what's called step runner. So you may, I'll show you through this diagram and you'll see in the demo. I make a pipeline custom resource. That's basically a way to say, dear Plagos, set me up, if you will, an assembly line in your software factory for this project. And you'll see what's in the custom resource. The main thing in the custom resource is what the project is. So what the Git repos are and how I want them to be manifest inside of my cluster. For us, in what we do with our, uh, our teams, we want to deploy it locally to an in-cluster Git team. You know, sort of a little GitHub that runs inside of our mighty fortress, which is you know Kubernetes OpenShift. Then, armed with that, with the Jenkins file in the project, a build is kicked off, just like any other build. It's just Ploigos as part of the platform installed a Jenkins kind of main server for us. That main server is told, and it also gets set up on that main server. Hey, I have a new assembly line for you, a new conveyor belt, whatever you want to call it, for this reference app code project. And that looks at the Jenkins file like any other Jenkins file in any project, which points to a Ploigos library, which binds in this thing called the Ploigos step runner, which is basically a way to decouple the tool chain, if you will, from what happens in every given step. So what happens in the steps is in this Python library and each step is a conglomeration of these different kind of plugins. So one is for signing, one is for running SonarCube, one is for Maven, right? If that makes any sense. Again, all of this is not necessarily telling everyone in the world, this is how you should do it. This is just so you, how you could make sense of the demo that I'm about to show you. As the different steps of Jenkins is done, and these are steps that you would recognize from best practices, white papers around the world, it uses differently configured steps in the step runner library. And this config.yaml that I call out inside my project, I can further refine on top of what the platform has in terms of configuration, how I want my asset to be built. So some of that information will come from the platform, like where the heck is SonarCube in this factory, but what tests I wanna run, that might be something that I can configure to the local project. Right, So the factory plus the project creates, if you will, an assembly line, which in this case is implemented with Jenkins. We also have a Tecton flavor for those of you who are Tecton minded. So I'll just show you that and then, and then kind of questions. So to make a pipeline, uh, to make a pipeline, it sounds like a novel, to make a pipeline. So I'm gonna move some things around a little bit here. There's our factory. I wanna create myself a new assembly line. So I do that with the pipeline custom resource for our operator and our Ploigos world. Creating a pipeline, I'm just gonna do a YAML view of this and I'll paste in my stuff. And what I wanna point out is that again, I say my overall app is called the reference app and I have a reference app code, which is at this Git location. Again, who knows where this Git location is for the demo, it's in GitHub. And then I have a Helm, a config repo, GitOpsy thing in reference Helm, and I want my service name to be called reference app fruit. It's, an, it's a highly trusted app that spits out information about fruit for some reason, it's a demo. So once I create this custom resource, so code Helm, as we talked about, when I go and click create, that's gonna create that assembly line. So it's gonna migrate the projects into Gitty. It's gonna tell Jenkins about those projects. It's gonna set up a Jenkins job. If I look at the pipeline, I can see that, hey, it's already done everything that it needed to do to get to the desired state for that custom resource. I can search for Jenkins in the, in the developer topology view, log in using, I'm going to use the OpenShift single sign-on. There is a single sign-on that Ploigos uses. Inside the platform, as Andreas was talking about, I'm going to look at the blue ocean view of Jenkins. And you can see it kicked off a build for me. That was a configuration option the astute of you may have noticed in the custom resource. And it's pulling in a groovy script that builds out the Ploigos library. So the Jenkins file is in, does, it has configuration in it that tells 
how to build out all these stages, which is why you kind of see it built out. Just looking inside Gitty, here's the code. Here's my project, my reference project with the Jenkins information, right? So like I said, it points to something that Polygos provides. So that team manages, which is sort of the groovy script that gets driven by these parameters. And that builds out a Jenkins pipeline for me based on this information. So that's one of the things is a Jenkins file for my project to qualify to be built in this software factory. The second thing is this config.yaml, which is project specific uh, options that I want to be able to override in building my asset. And there is one thing that I'm going to override for this demo is I've added my own step implementer, which we'll get to at the end, this notion of the record log. Um, but we'll come to that in a second. But some foreshadowing for you. Stick around if you want to figure out what that record thing is. This is also more foreshadowing. This is the developer perspective on Wrecker. I've run it locally within my cluster, but it doesn't have to be run here just for the sake of a demo. We'll again, come to that plenty before we're done here. Just proving that it's up and running. I can run it locally. We'll talk about what Wrecker is, why it matters. Now, while it's busy, it's still gonna be, it ran those unit tests forever and ever. Then it, here are different typical blue ocean. I can look at all the logs um, that'll come into play in a, in a little bit. So there are outputs. Every step has different artifacts that it produces, which we'll get to at the end. Static analysis, I have output that it produces from, from that. And you kind of get the idea. It's going to go through all these different stages. It's going to push artifacts to Nexus. These are typical things to do for like Java projects. And if I just kind of skip through some of this stuff, I create an image, I scan an image. This is the point that Andreas made before where the scan actually broke. And another thing I'll say about having an operator, I had to adjust what tests I wanted Ploigos to run. And I wound up changing a, a custom resource that the operator managed and the operator wound up blowing away those changes. So if I wasn't, if the operator is running and running properly, it's, there are many different controls to kind of keep things from being tampered with. What you saw just go by there, we'll come back to, that was sort of it writing out what happened in the build using Wrecker or just a demonstration of how one might use Wrecker, similar to Graphius again, as we start to get closer to that. And you can see I'm skipping dev, I'm moving to test and prod. So it's gonna deploy my application to test and prod. It runs some Selenium tests behind the scenes. There's a fair amount of complexity that our consulting team has already put into this because these are things that they do all the time. This proves that it actually deployed something out to our production namespace. That's what we're calling production in this demo. And then that's the end of the pipeline. All the way at the end, you can see it's meant to deploy this fruit service. Again, thank God we have a fruit service now deployed and safe. And if I just refresh this, just to prove the pipeline is completely finished. And this time it was green, not red, not because I was missing some patch, because I, you know, as far, as far as this pipeline is concerned, this was a success, successful assembly run line within my software factory. So I'll pause there. Any comments, questions, things people want to see in the live, in the live cluster? It's fine if not. I won't feel bad. I guess I would like to understand <clears throat> a little bit more about overrides. So in that file there, it looks like you have the, these software factories are. Docker images, can, can you override the arguments? Let's say I have a, um, I don't know, for example, um, a certain Maven Java edition that I want to use for the build, like 1.8. Can I override that anyway? Or it pretty much just comes, what you see is what you get. Does that make yes. sense? Yes, it does. I'll, I'll talk about my experience and then somebody closer to the project may want to say more. I will say it is 100% possible because I had to do it to make this demo. So if you see that line there, I inserted my own container, right? And that this is my project, this is my crappy project. I'm going to put in my own container there. And that was a way I could do it. A more, a better way to do it, right, is one that's less intrusive, is changing configuration values as you kind of see here. So I ultimately wanted to adapt what tests I ran with OpenSCAP. And I, I used, you know, sort of their workbench with help from a per chain, I think is on this call. Like he provided me this kind of customized version of the workbench to be able to like skip a couple tests because I didn't want it 
to test those things because it could fail at any time. Mm -hmm. And that, that gives an example of sort of light configuration. What I'm doing here is probably ill-advised and requires deeper knowledge of sort of how Polygos is, is running. I think most, most of the time you'd want to only have to change things like this, but that's how the project will evolve to make stuff like that mm -hmm. easier. Anyone who's on the project want to say more about the thoughts behind that? If not, that's fine. But just giving space if anybody Is on the project wants to. Ploigos or Ploigos? How do you pronounce it? <laughs> you pro I think it's Ploigos. That's how I've heard it said. Okay. It's Ploigos, but it's not as bad as in Red Hat. You have Quay. In <laughs> Red Hat. So um, obviously, Red Hat has a fair bit of experience with um, you know supply chain security. I mean, Red Hat got hacked in 2008, the whole Fedora thing. Um, what was the motivation for this project? Like, I'm, I'm genuinely interested to know that because to, to Justin's point, there's, you know, some similar tooling out here that, that kind of fits into the puzzle. So I'm, I'm pretty keen to understand what, what was the core motivation for building something like this? Again, I could take a swing at that, but I'd rather someone on the project maybe since so, they're here. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. I wasn't there at the start of the project, but as I understand it, um, the primary driver was essentially a, 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 an identified gap in between here is the US DOD's DevSecOps reference design. Here's the what, but not the how. Um, and a, I guess a desire to have an essentially something that comes in and fills that how so that folks who go, hey, I need to be aligned with DeadSword can get off the ground very quickly with a tool chain that aligns directly back to dead sword meets all of the requirements etc that's a sense that's my understanding of essentially why it came into existence because i looked and went there's nothing that really exists that makes sense have you have you read through the the devsecops framework the the dead sword the devsecops reference design i have yeah yeah cool cool i i, I appreciate that that response i I've, I've read through it myself quite a bit and done a little bit with it myself to try and implement, you know, some of the stuff they have in platform one, for example. And it's, it's very much so this, you know, massive resource of the, you know, wild west, like where do you kind of start? So I can, I can absolutely appreciate that. Just for, just for the dummies, I guess. Um, and, and this, this might be, you know, feel free to chime in here, Justin, for, for in Toto if it's relevant, but um, let, let's just take a, a scenario where you know you know um you're you're a security tool like nmap and uh you know you're, you're hosted on uh, i don't know what whatever like linode or something and some big bad cyber gang um you know roots one of your boxes and you know they, they pop a vps and they've you know they've got root and you know all of a sudden they've, they've got access to your software and you know they they re-upload a version that, that has some malware hidden in it like how does this protect users from that from that particular problem because I mean that's ultimately the goal of, of software supply chain security. Like Matt, when you say they upload your software, what, what are they uploading? Like uh, well, they're breaking into your Git in, in, in the past you'd, you'd download you know something like Nmap, right? And you'd yep. in MD5 check some, you'd make sure that the char is, is valid against what you're actually downloading. Um, you know if, if a particular piece of software was compromised and you know, an attacker uploaded a malicious version of that software and put it on, you know, the, the internet. How, how does this protect users from that? So, kind of as I, as I was saying before, there is always the need to have additional controls over and on top. But where this can potentially come in is, and I, Mark kind of touched on it, is because there is this decoupling between the pipeline and the tools, it becomes possible to, in, to, to write and inject new, I guess, implementations of steps in there. So let's say, for example, that we've got a Git step implementer, which is basically, hey, check out the things. There's no reason that couldn't be extended or enhanced to also include verifications of the committer and folks like that. So it doesn't have the tools out of the box today to do it, but it could be built and added in as part of the pipeline. So, so it's really just a framework to stitch other stuff together. To do so that, in an opinionated way. Yes, uh -huh. because yeah. yeah, if you start from dead sword, the what, not the how, as Adam said, we're starting to fill in the how. 
But then questions of like, well, how do we really, now that we've got a bit of a framework, how do we further harden that framework and how do we make it customizable? Because we're trying to balance the interests of security. Well, we want everything to be repeatable, but tool chains tend to be very snowflakey in the real world. So yeah. how can we kind of balance those two interests? That's what is, you're kind of seeing emerge here. Yeah, and that, why that's we want to fair, share it all with you. Man. That's, that's a very fair call. Um, okay, well, look, it's, it's pretty polished so far. So well done. <laughs> right, polished. <laughs> yes, I mean, look, I'm glad it's coming across that way. Put together in a polished way. I got to say, it's quite nice. It's got pretty pictures and it's got all. Yeah, well, some of that is just OpenShift. OpenShift demos. We, we well. promise it's we, we promise it's not lips to kind of pick. We promise. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, just a quick question in terms of yeah, the, sure. open, the open source part of this. So high level what i've seen today is there's a few layers so we have the container we possibly have the kubernetes deployment and then we have the framework itself which ones could i go in today and maybe make a pr against can i do it at the container level the framework or all three all three so, yeah go ahead adam you, you take yeah so it, everything for this is up um i was gonna say upstairs upstream in <laughs> github slash ployos um, all the container definitions are there. The workflow definitions are there. Um, the operator definitions are there, all written in Ansible. So yeah, it's it's all there and ready to well, accept any and all PRs. I've actually had a look at that repo and it, it's all very biased towards Red Hat Open. Are there, are there plans to make the more generic vanilla Kubernetes flavor? We let the community decide. Uh, yeah. it's, you know, it's up for our customers. So obviously, uh, we're building on technology. We we know the source code off, and we know it works. And um, one, we, in like being conscious of time, I really would like us to to demo the the record part of it. That's where the the uh, you know the signing and the um, you know the attestation basically comes in. If that's okay, Matt. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with that, but uh, yeah, let me let me get to that before we run out of time and then questions at the at the end. So Wrecker. So Wrecker is a part of SIG store. So there's a separate group of projects, Cosign, Wrecker, a bunch of things. And there's a lot going on in the space. They're in Toto kind of friends. Uh, in, this, in this case, what we're looking to demonstrate is just as you guys were pointing out, hey, this framework is great, but there are all these things you could add to it we decided like, hey, let's try and add something to the framework. And Rekor seemed like a thing to add for multiple reasons, which hopefully I'll get to before we're done. So again, what we're doing is trying to write our build activities to a tamper evidence store in a way that may have been something that could have helped in terms of software supply chain attacks like solar winds. I understand it's not a remedy for it, but being able to see here were all the steps in the chain that went from this git commit to this container build, let's say. What if we had something that could immutably attest everything that happened now that we have our framework? So dead sword the how, the framework is the what. Now that I've made some opinionated calls about the what, it lends itself to say, well, what if each of these steps someday had to write out the output of each of these steps into an immutable database so that auditors or other things could automatically check that? So what I'm demonstrating here, and this is just a demonstration, this isn't exactly how it would be implemented, is I'm saying, when I go to sign the image, I'm also going to do two things. I'm going to store the signed image in record to say, I, the build chain, I'm going to you know, use my keys to sign it. I, the build chain, made this image. And then I'm also going to add a node. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to record also in record artifacts that went into building this image. And again, stored in a mutual database, in this case, Trillium. So transparency.dev, sort of Google's Trillium uh, project, open source project. We'll get to build nodes in a second. So let me just introduce Record really quickly. If uh, oh, Zoom, thank you, Zoom. All right, here we go. So Zoom was just preventing me from showing you this video. So where we last left our heroes, this is the thing I wanted to show about signing the container image. So what you see here is I've got private keys that represent the tool chain, and it's using those keys to sign images. So I sign a container image, which is kind of what you see here, using a Ploigos's key um, for the, the factory. It signed an image, that's cool, that'll be important in a second. It also 
stores that image in Nexus. So it's internal, it's using sort of an internal, using Nexus as a container image registry. And then finally at the very end, this is what I was showing before where I put two things in. When I go to sign the container image, I podman sign, I curl push to Nexus and I use my record log. I log to my local Kubernetes local kind of record instance. I log two entries. One is sort of the, the last build node. We'll talk about what that means in a second. And there'll be some command line here. So you see the record URL has a service level address, service local address. I need to turn that into a public address just to prove that this is my record server. I have it exposed publicly. Again, think of record, how we're using it right now is it's a little bit like Graphius. Uh, I don't know tons about Graphius, but it's meant to kind of do that. Graphius meets Trillion, let's say. And it'll become more apparent as we go on. If I actually look at the entry that the build chain wrote to record, what I see is, oh my God, Jason. So let me just make it a little prettier. There's a body of UU encoded data, but there's an inclusion proof as you'd expect from immutable databases that says, okay, so I've got a database of a, there's a Merkle tree behind the scenes. The body is interesting, we'll get to that. The thing at the top is the UU ID of the leaf node, which Wrecker uses to find entries. If I look at the Wrecker command line, there are things I can do with entries in Wrecker. I can verify those entries, Merkle root, inclusion proof, all that. I can get those entries. I can search through those entries and I can upload. Uploading has been done by the, by the build chain. Now, if I go to the next, I think I'll just jump to the next one. This is gonna talk about build nodes. So, and again, the question's right at the end, just for the sake of time. Uh, so Adam and I got to chat about this. This was kind of fun. So here's how we imagined that something like this could work, both for attestation auditors and all that. And also eventually you'll see at the very end a way we can hook into maybe things like Intoto is doing or Critis does or all this kind of stuff. I built an image with a tag. You could imagine I could build an image and make an alias of that tag as a UUID that represents the last thing that happened in the build chain. So that last thing is, the, is sort of my first build node. That first build node could say, here's the step. So that first build node is sort of saying, this is the culmination of the whole build chain. I built artifact X. And the previous, if you wanna see what happened before, here's the previous entry in record, which is itself a build node. So sort of a link list inside an immutable database. And this thing would be all hashed in the same way you'd expect from an immutable database with its step name, with whatever output is relevant to it. Maybe it's the unit tests or you know, pick a thing, or maybe it's a static analysis with an entry to the previous step and so on all the way down to eventually the previous UUID would be zero. And thus you'd have a way of creating the whole provenance, everything that happened from checkout from div all the way to the creation of an image in an immutable database that you could verify for yourself. So anyone anywhere could look this up as well as for the sake of auditing and all this kind of stuff, right? So again, let me run through this and then we'll get to questions at the end. Just to give you more of a sense of what record can do, I can look up the last entry in record by saying, get me that UUID, get it in JSON and use JQ just to kind of format it so we can make sense of it. This is how record stores things in Trillion, right? So it's got a body. You can change how record stores things. That's outside the scope of this. But the things we care about in its data is this extra data, which we'll get to. The signature is stored in record. The public key is stored in record as well as UUID. Wrecker ultimately wants to be also a PKI solution because with, this, with the immutable database, I don't need to keep those keys forever if I can prove I had access to those keys at the time I sunk it into the immutable database. But see SigStore, the Wrecker project to learn more about that. I'm gonna look at that extra data to pull out my build node. When I pull out my build node, I see that the step in question again for the demo, there's only one step that's signing anything, it's that sign container image step that you see there, right? So in this step, and that matches that string exactly, that's what I wrote out. I said, my step was sign container image. My step output was A64 encoded, but we will see in a second that that is exactly the signature that was stored. And then finally the record ID. So what I've done is I put into record proof that if the image was signed by record, now this whole build chain this chain of 
of what happened, bill of goods on the assembly line is now all signed in record. So I have another way of verifying that this, it, the build chain did what I thought it would do. In terms of verifying, there's a number of different ways I can verify. I may skip through some of this. You can verify by artifact. You can verify by public key, right? So if you only have the artifact or you only have the public key, you, you need the artifact, the public key and signature. If you didn't have the original entry, that's kind of what I'm going to show here. For the sake of time, uh, I'll let it go for a sec, just to give you a sense. The artifact, in our case, is the last build node. The last signature entry, I'm going to pull that out of Rekor. I'm going to look to Rekor to get that. I could get that somewhere else if I wanted to, but I'll pull that out of Rekor. So that's the detached signature. And the last bit is a public key. And just showing that I could get that from anywhere. If I have the public key in a secret, and again, I'm just using the OpenShift UI to quickly navigate to that secret, right? And again, demonstration, I probably wouldn't keep the private key there, but if the public key is right there, I can say, hey, Plego's public key, I'm gonna paste that in. And now what Record can do for me is not only verify the inclusion proof, but verify that this artifact was definitely signed with this public key, and this is a signature that goes with that artifact. And it will do all of that. And it says here, yes, it was, otherwise it wouldn't have returned at all. So it says what the hash is, it gives me the tree root in case I wanna do my own kind of inclusion proof. And in fact, the CLI does its own inclusion proof locally based on the SHAs from the tree. Current tree size is only two because I've only put two things in because this is a demo and this is the first time I ever ran this. You can see I was, this is the calls that I was making to my local record. Again, not so not so interesting, just proving that I was calling Wrecker inside of here. There's also a public Wrecker instance, which I chose not to sully with my demo. You can also search through Wrecker. Again, just to give you a sense of what Wrecker does, I can search by public key or by SHA. So if I want to take, if I want to take my artifact, which is the build node, or in this case, you know, that build node that wraps the signature, I could search for it that way. Search by SHA, which is what you kind of see here. And I get back the UUID. I expect that UUID again for the sake of time. I'm going to skip through that. The UUID does match what I had before. I can also search based on the public key. So I could take the Polygos public key and say, hey, let me see all the entries that Polygos has made. And there's two. Our build, our link list is only two. It's the one at the end with the container signature. And then there's another one which has the output of the build. Right. And that's sort of what you see here. Just proving that there is a public record server out there. There's no reason it has to be local to my cluster. In fact, we want it to be transparent, but just proving I didn't write to that record server. And I may have the, you know, if the tree root changed, I could know that, oh, this isn't the tree root I expected for anyone who's verifying this. And then finally, this is the last bit I wanted to show you guys today. Let's play with these kind of build nodes. I told you the last build node is what we said was the signature. In our case, it'll be the signature of the output, the the container output, right? So let's just see if that matches. Can I take a public key, which is the Ploigo's public key? I have it locally here. Can I basically get that signature file, right? Let, just proving that the signature file, that this thing is signed by Ploigo's. When I then go to decrypt it with GPG, right? I download it and then I JQ. What I should see is sure enough, it was signed by the service account. Again, the tree, again, a demo, we don't have the verification of this key, but we know it was this key, regardless of who owns this key. I can also do the same thing with the signature content that was in the last build node. And using that, I should be able to decrypt. I should be able to use the signature content. That signature content should represent the signature that was in Nexus, blah, blah, blah. If I output that, what we'll see is should match this up here, which it does. You can see it's the same thing, it's the same build. So these are ways that you can start to do some verification. The other thing I wanna show is if I go down through my linked list in the tree, I can get to that previous build node just by looking at the last build node, pulling out the previous ID. And again, you can imagine wrapping this in some sort of CLI. I can get that previous build node and then look at its extra data which will show me the step name, some content, and the previous record ID. And that's what you see here, although the step is much bigger. Again, same step because it's the same step that I ran this from, sign container image.
but that represents this first thing that I put. Sorry, yeah, yeah, this first one that I put right over here, I highlighted the wrong one. This first one, which is the build output, right? And so if I decode that, which I'm gonna quickly just do right now, following the same things, previous record ID is zero, that means there's no further entries in this chain. If I take the step output, you see the step results that from this build. So this is just an XML file that gets produced by Ploigos. Again, this is just a demonstration, but it kind of gives you an idea of the kind of things you could have per step and be able to unpack. Um, and that's where I want to start. The last thing I'd say before we end our time is a future demo. And I think there are other people trying to do this, but you can imagine I didn't get time to do this. Integrating with things like OPA or Gatekeeper, which brings OPA to Kubernetes, you're going to imagine a world where even a simple admission hook that does a record verify on a UUID of an image in certain participating namespaces would allow you to follow this pattern that you see from the transparency.dev website about assume this is Kubernetes, this is the deployment. You could have the web controller kind of checking, oh, hey, is this an image that I know has verifiably been built by my tool chain? If that makes sense. So possibilities for the future. And OPA that's is the open policy that, agent, just in case you. you that's correct. At the end, we kind of threw a lot in all at the end. Sorry, we probably left too much time for questions in the middle. But yes. So questions now for the last three minutes that we have, or anything that you guys want to do. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Matt, for, for cutting you off before, Matt, but I, I thought it's important to. Um, no, no, know, no, to no. Hey, to man, that's no, no. Th thanks so much, guys. That was amazing. I'm, I'm, that's a cool project. Yeah, I like it because uh, I'm I'm sort of building like a common patterns library myself, and it's like, why am I doing it by myself if I can contribute <laughs> to something like this, right? Yes. So, is there like a Slack group or something where you can be more involved, or how do we? What's the next step? How do we? How do we engage? That's a great point. Uh, there is one for Rekor. There's a Slack group. I'm not sure there's a Slack group for Plogos yet. Adam, do you have more on that? There's no Slack group for Plogos yet, but to be fair, we probably do need to set one up. Um, at the moment, the best place to engage is on, on the GitHub repos. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Awesome. So shame that we're out, out of time, but I, I did want to get Justin's view as well in terms of, you know, uh, solar wind and, and supply chain attacks and, and how that would help. So ideally, you, you build your, your Ploigos <laughs> um, operator as well through a software, uh, you know, to the, to the factory. Um, but the, the point is, where, where do you start, right? And, and would that ever be possible without actually having full control and understanding of the source code that is used to, to build whatever it is, whether it's the operator or the, the software, right? So Matt was saying, what if someone um, uploads, uh, you know, dodgy sort of components. And I think the, the record sort of Merkle tree um, addressed this a little bit, but where do you realistically start? Right. So, yeah, and, and Intoto has different ways of managing and handling this. Um, we actually worked with Git, and so uh, they've redone parts of their signing scheme because we found design flaws in the way that Git signing worked. Um, for Git tags and other aspects like that. They actually use Santiago's code, uh, who's the, the lead of the Intoto project and a design that he and I and some of our collaborators came up with. So yeah, there's there's like a bunch of stuff that exists that already does this in the like Intoto scope. Cause I think that project's been working at this problem from the different angle where we've been very security focused um, from day one. And that's been really the sort of primary thing. And also we've been, I think, very vendor and technology agnostic. Um, and so like, I, I'm really impressed by what you have and really um, I'm looking forward to digging deeper into, uh, you know, like some of the different pieces, but it's also a little, in some ways hard for me to understand because I don't have the, there's, there feels like there's a lot that's very vendor specific here. Um, and it's hard for me to disentangle some of the security properties from, you know, some of the the other things going on. But uh, yeah, I, I, it was really enlightening and, and really enjoyed learning about it. Thank you, Justin. Matt, do you want to close the call or are there any further questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Did, did anybody else have any other questions? 
No, thank you very much. That was um, that was awesome. I really Great. It. Great. Well, um, look, uh, if if you guys want to get in touch with Andreas, he's he's on Slack. Um, so feel free to reach out to him. You can check out the GitHub repo. And and thanks so much, everyone from Red Hat. That was that was really enlightening. I really appreciated that. And yeah, thanks so much. That was really cool. Awesome. Thanks for having us and see you at the project. And yes, if you have anything um, in terms of extensions that makes it, you know, just as applicable for any other platform, absolutely. Right. So that's the exactly the point behind an open source project. So thanks a lot for having us. Yeah. Guys. Yeah. I think, look, as I mentioned, I took a quick look on the call at the repo. Um, you know, obviously, you know, just available for OpenShift right now. But from what I read, it doesn't seem too hard to get this running on vanilla Kubernetes. So you know, I'm going to have a little bit more of a play. And yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing. Hey, um, JJ, are you, you still here, buddy? Is there yeah, anything you wanted to touch on while you're, while you're here, man? No, no. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, putting this together. This is an awesome project. Um, one thing I would suggest is uh, uh, try and see if we can pull together a demo that has uh, that doesn't have anything that's uh, OpenShift or Red Hat specific. Uh, it'll, it'll serve a few purposes in terms of uh, trying to get wider feedback and adoption. Uh, and for a project that's as useful as this, I think uh, it'll also be useful to see how this plays in well with uh, other open projects that we have, like what uh, Justin was saying about in Toto and stuff. So I would uh, I mean, if you're interested and if you're curious in uh, getting more community involvement, I think it'll be a useful thing to do. Uh, that's that's not uh, uh, a demo. That's not too vendor specific. That's what I would do. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it's a use. It's awesome. It's it's a good learning for a lot of lot of lot of folks, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be useful for a for the community overall. Thank you so much for putting this together. No problem. Yeah. Thanks for the feedback. We're definitely going to take that into account, you know, and hope, hope to come back in the future, obviously, to show how the project has evolved. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, is there anybody else on the call want to want to um, say anything before we we close? I think we're pretty much running out of time now. So. Yeah, I guess just what we briefly touched on at the start. Um, I'm going to KubeCon. Yeah, I'm at, like, if anyone wants to maybe hang out for you know, 10 minutes or something um, sometime, just, just let me know. Yeah, for sure. That is a can, cool idea. Yeah, have a discussion on, on one of the key talks that we go on. Or maybe at the end of it, we can also do key takeaways and have a talk about it or something like that. It just makes it... Um, nicer being not in that region, you know, because it's quite an exciting event for me. So it'd be nice to, to share that with people and talk about it. Yep, I'm down. Right. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, um, cool, cool. Well, hey, look, um, just, just for, for those of you in, in you know, the, in, in, in Australia um, or, or even APAC, I guess it's pretty relevant. Um, just, just to let you know, uh, Brad and I have, have been in touch with Bill Mulligan from the Linux Foundation, and um, we're going to be spinning up Kubernetes, like the KCDs, the Kubernetes Community Days here in, in Sydney, um, where you know we're reaching out to different vendors for, for sponsorship, et cetera, at the moment to try and get things organised. Um, there's a very open invitation to anyone who gets wants to get involved in, in something like this. Um, it's, you know, a massive undertaking. Um, for full transparency, the, the Kubernetes um, Forum 2019, like to date, the largest conference that's been hosted in Australia for, for, in the cloud native space, that, that's been indefinitely cancelled. Um, and, and it's the view of you know, the CNCF and Linux Foundation that this will kind of replace that now. Um, so yeah, look, if, if you want to know any more information or if you want to get involved, please just ping me because Brad and I would really appreciate any help or support you could offer. Yeah. 
And um, yeah, other than that, we'll keep you guys posted. And yeah, all the best. We'll chat to you guys soon, I guess. Have a great day. Yeah. Cheers, Tim. Cheers. See you, mate. Bye. Bye. See you. Thanks, everyone.